Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Backbeat. I've got my good friend Earl Bennett from Earl Drums here. Earl, good morning. Good morning, Eric. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again, too, man. So we were we were starting to get into some cool drum stuff before we started recording. So let's start there. We were talking about your sound, um, and um, I was talking specifically about your Chick Corea cover that you just did. Um, talk to me about about how you approach a song like that because that was pretty complex. Well, first off, the songs I pick can be anything, any genre that I enjoy, and that was just one of those genres in college that I started listening to jazz and Chick Corea and others and Miles and Coltrane and a billion other jazz artists I could find, Max Roach and Art Blakey, and. I never took to becoming a jazz drummer, but I did take to wanting to play that kind of music occasionally. So this was one album with Steve Gadd playing drums on it called Friends and Eddie Gomez on bass. And I just loved sitting there playing that song. So I would practice my jazz samba, basically playing along to that song. So I did it a few years back, um, probably about 2019 I did it. And, um, I couldn't get a drumless track at that point. I didn't have extract stems at that point. So I was playing over top of Steve and I never really liked playing over top of other drummers. That's one of my things. So I thought it was a good time to pull it out, but how do I approach it? I approach it, just put that, the phones on and play through it a few times. And this time was kind of neat because I pulled Steve way back, almost out completely. And I just sat in there and played. I think I played it three times pretty much. And that was it. Yeah. But I knew the song. I, 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 I got to understand something. I've been listening to this song for 40 something years. So it's kind of like in me. It's one of those songs I'll put on sometimes. I'll just play that album on an airplane or something. You know, I just love the album. Yeah. Great. I love it. Well, and I love your, your song selection too. And it really has kind of opened me up to a, uh, it's extended my variety of tastes just listening because you play, you've played a lot of Chicago. Um, and and there's a lot of other a, a lot of other artists kind of from that 70s um right. realm is that is that kind of primarily been your drumming influence for you that era i think the year we the years that we are teenagers and 20 somethings and we're listening to a lot of music are the years that stay in us and make us happy that's my happy music you know it reminds me of being a kid it reminds me of being a teenager it reminds me of different points in my life. Oh, I remember this song came out the year I did this. Or I remember this song that came out the year I did that. And we all have our happy place. You know what I mean? Your years in Rich Raw Dog's happy place seems to be like 90s music. You know, 80s, late to 80s, 90s, into the 2000s. You know, and you connect with it. It's where you connect. It's what you enjoy. Right. Different age. You know, we're about 10 years, 12 years difference probably. You know, that's what that's what causes that. And I found that as I get older, I want to play music that I enjoy. Yeah. So I got a lot of guys that watch me because I play that style of music. I'll play 70s and 60s. And I was in a 60s and 70s band and it's considered classic rock. A lot of the stuff I play. And, you know, yeah. we were the John, the boomer genre was the, the music genre that everybody kind of still considers. Like we still love Led Zeppelin and Rush. You know what I mean? Right. I have too much respect for the guys who really play that stuff well to go and play those songs. And that's why you don't see me do a lot of Rush or Led Zeppelin. It's not that I wouldn't try it. It's just I have such a level of respect for the guys that are just, you know, Neil guys or John Bonham guys. Like, I'm friends with George Flutus. We, we kind of go back and forth on Instagram and stuff. Nice. And George, he does Bonhamology. You would think that's all he knows how to do is play John Bonham, but the guy is an amazing jazz drummer. I mean, he's a, you just go watch his jazz drumming channel and you watch him on Insta playing. He, he's got the vocabulary. I mean, the whole jazz vocabulary from the sixties and back, he knows it all. He's just a great drummer period. You know, but you would think he only knows how to play John Bonham stuff. If you watch Bonhamology and he's the expert at it, but he's just a great drummer. So I think, that's the that's the point is I've always wanted to be a great drummer and that meant in my generation it was learning lots of different styles and my generation had lots of styles to learn you had jazz you had rock you had 
and to make money at a gig, you know, making money playing gigs, you had to play everything. So I played weddings. I learned the great American songbook. I learned fifties music. I learned sixties. So my vocabulary is quite vast, but then I stop at a certain point. I go, how far do I want to go? And that's really where, that's what I've been struggling with lately is that I've done in the last year, I've been on six or seven songs on Spotify from friends in West Palm beach area that have released tracks, more modern tracks. They take my drums, they chop them up, they beat detective them, they do whatever they want to. You know what I mean? That's how we record today. And I listen to the music and it's saying something and I'm proud of what I've done. I'm proud to be on their projects, but the new music doesn't speak to me because we're not recording the way we used to record. We're not in a room playing together. So I miss that. What I get from doing drum covers is I get to play with the greatest musicians in the world. I take the drummer out and I get to be the drummer. So yeah. that's how, I, you know? Yeah. I love that. That's been such an, and I, and I totally get what you're saying about those formative years. Um, and I know we, you and I have talked about this before. Like my formative years were very much Christian contemporary music, Christian rock. And so even kind of that, that sound carries over into what I enjoy today whether it's you know ccm or otherwise and and it definitely greatly colors the types of music that i i find like i like all music but i right. really enjoy certain you know some very certain things you know and um i think that's a very true statement um is there is there anything on the modern radar that you've heard that you're like that's not too bad you know I find most pop music to, I don't, I don't connect to the pop music. That's my problem. You know what I mean? But when I I go into the eighties and nineties and early two thousands and connect with certain bands like that, my son was, might've been into, you know, things like Weezer or Green Day. It's not not my wheelhouse. You know what I mean? I'll sit there and I'll play it. I don't feel authentic sometimes when I'm approaching it. Uh, Code Heating Cambria. I mean, my son listened to a lot of that. And I was exposed to that, that stuff. Um, but I like Dave Matthews better. You know, I'd rather listen to Dave Matthews band or something like that. Um, I, I kind of connect with jam bands and that kind of stuff. You know, okay. interesting talking to, to Trey B yesterday on, I was watching the interview with him and you guys got into this whole thing about Striper. <laughs> and, you know, the funny you mentioned that, I mean, I have a whole Christian music thing that's really obscure Christian music compared to, modern ccm of today you know what i mean even though i've played a lot at church so i know a lot of the modern ccm of today too unfortunately Uh, (laughs) of i love keith green and second chapter of acts and phil keg and all this stuff in the 80s you know like i was in a band and we toured with um different groups like res band and I, i played on the stage with res band and the newsboys we opened before the newsboys then creation 90 stage i was on their i was on the big stage with creation 90 and with oh, a band called we went nowhere but newsboys went everywhere you know what was the uh, band called uh newsboys the or my band yeah my band was called water believe it or not okay water <laughs> water under the bridge it's done <laughs> <laughs> so, but the newsboys went on um but Striper. Interesting thing about Striper was my wife interviewed Robert Sweet. Matter of fact, um, I got to sit on his drum kit and my wife got to sit on his drum kit at the Felt Forum. They were the last band playing with Loudness and TNT and we were behind the, the black scrim, you know, curtain. And my wife was up there and you could see the, the symbols and we were pushing the symbols. I was going, man, that's a safety hazard. I, even then I was a safety guy, even though I wasn't even a safety guy yet at that point. I was like 87, I guess. But I, 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 knew, I was like, gosh, you're going to get slapped. You know, you used to do this like this, make the symbols go back and forth. Oh, and he like duck while playing. I mean, I thought that was the craziest thing. That was one of the little, <laughs> his little things. He talked about it. You know, we were backstage at the Fell Forum, so we were talking to him. And my wife did most of the talking, but I, I was there. I was sitting there right alongside of her, you know? Nice. Nice guy. Really nice guy to meet, you know? But metal's not one of my genres either. And even though I can play metal, I play with guys like... One of the guys I played with on my wife's album is a guy named Michael Terrell. And Michael Terrell's got some CCM albums out in the 2000s. 
And with Michael Terrell, I played with a guy named Jason Upton once. I filled in for their drummer. Um, I was not the drummer. I, their drummer got sick, and Michael called me up and said, hey, we're in Lakeland. Can you come drive two and a half hours to play with us the last show we have on this little leg of the tour? So I did. But Michael Terrell's claim to fame was he played with Mylon Lefebvre and Broken Heart. Okay. And he was one of the guys. He was the guy that had the pink, you know, I don't. I think it was an Ibanez, but it might have been a Strat, who knows. And he swirled his hair around and, you know. <laughs> He was that guy. And I had seen him in New Jersey back in the late 80s, early 90s with Milan. So it was kind of funny. I met him in 2000s when he was a youth pastor at a church. And I ended up playing drums at his church one day. He needed a drummer. And I came in. We became friends. So, I mean, I've met a lot of the guys that were doing that music is what I'm saying. And he, he thought I could play metal. I just never thought of myself as a metal drummer, you know. <laughs> sure. So, That's awesome. But, you know, that's why it was funny. My early YouTube experience was the only tracks you could find were what you'd find for rock band that were drumless. So I was trying Van Halen. I was doing those metal covers. You know, I was, you know, like Metallica and things like that. I never thought it was my wheelhouse. I just, I was doing them because now I could find a drumless track and I could play along and I'd rather play with a drumless track than play over a drum track, you yeah. know? The extract stems changed my life. That was that's that's what the last three years has been all extract stems. And I only play what I want to play now instead of playing what I have to play. I love that was a game changer for me too, and it's great because I, I like I think you and I are very similar in the fact that we play music we want to play that we enjoy playing. Um, I won't do. I did it one time. I did a cover just because it had come out, and I was like trying to catch that wave. You know, shameless shameless plug for numbers you know and um and it didn't pan out anyway um and i i ended up liking the song listening to it so much but typically i'll just pick what am i what's what am i jiving with you know what is what's you know speaking to me and that's that's the stuff that loretta and i picked for me to play in here and that's more authentic to you so that's why you come off sounding like great on that stuff because you enjoy doing it and I think that what you're communicating on YouTube with covers for me has always been, I want to communicate my joy. I want to communicate my love for the music. And when I'm doing it, I'm not phoning it in. I'm playing it. You know what I mean? And I've been asked to do covers for people and I've done a few and I feel like I'm phoning it in and I don't enjoy that or I'm struggling with it. And I'm going, this really isn't my thing. So um, I actually got a, a call last, I got a call a week ago. And they wanted to see some of my work because they wanted to hire me for a recording session. So I sent them a whole list of my songs. I sent them my Spotify playlist of songs I played on. And they said, okay, we're going to hire you. You know, let's talk about it. So he sends me the track and I listened to it. And I had a recorded drum track. It was kind of like a Calypso thing. It was a gospel thing, but it was a Calypso gospel thing. I didn't connect to the track and all I'm going to get to work with is this really cheesy keyboard sound. It almost, it almost, the track almost sounded to me with the drum machine, the way you had it programmed. It kind of like sounded like something you get on one of those cheap keyboards you buy at like BJ's or something. And you push <laughs> the, those presets and I'm going, Oh man, I am not hearing this. I am not hearing this. I'm not feeling this. I call him back. I said, yeah, I don't think I'm the guy for this track. I'm, I, I'm not here. I don't want to take your money. You know, I, I take money from somebody and you're going to be unhappy with it in the end. Go find some kid who loves doing that kind of style of music and let him play the heck out of it. Then you can just take it and do what you're going to do to it, which is you're going to cut it up, chop it up, put it on the grid. You know, right. you're going to be happy with what you did because you're the producer. And that's where we now live. Music is a producer world. If you're a producer, everybody's a producer of music. You have a you have a DAW, you're a producer of music. You chop up other people's stuff, you make it sound the way you want it to sound, and you did it. Even the pros get chopped like this. I was talking to John J.R. Robinson, and he played on Daft Punk's hit, you know, that one Lucky. Yeah. He yeah. Played, Wanna be lucky. Da, 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 you know, him and Omar are on that track. Both of them are on the track. They chopped them up, cut them both up, stuck them in there. He goes, I couldn't even 
I couldn't even hear myself in that track, but I'm on it. So I'm on another hit record. You know? so we'll great. put that on the resume. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a bunch of resume songs this year that I played on. I'm going, I got resume songs, but what I ended up playing and then what they did to me, it's not music I'm, I love. So yeah. when I'm on YouTube, what do I want to play? Let's play what I love. Yeah. So that's what I try to do. And I try to be authentic. And I'm not going to sound like my friend Rich Raw Dog playing some 90s grunge, you know, like, yeah. that he loves. I'm not going to sound as authentic as him playing. You know what I mean? Because he loves it. It's the music that sits in his heart, you know. And you playing the Christian rock you play or the stuff that speaks to your heart. Or Trey B. Like, I love Trey. I could never play Trey's stuff. I mean, I if I did, I'd butcher it. But he knows I'm a player. We talk, we talk offline all the time, you know, not commute like phone calls. We should, probably should do phone calls. You know, if you see this Trey, give me a call one of these days. We yeah. can talk. Probably have a lot of fun talking, you know. Um, but he's a great player, but it's his he does his thing and he knows I can do all this other stuff. We all we all have our thing that we do. So just embrace it, you know, that's what I say, you know. Yeah, and I think you can <clears throat> as a if you're a well-rounded musician. You could like your what I know of your musicianship, even in a situation where you're like, this isn't really my thing. You could lay down a track that would sound great, but there is something different, like you're saying about when you really are are vibing with it, like when you feel it and it means something to you. There's a difference, I think, in how it comes across. And, you know, if I'm doing the final drum track over top of a program track that's almost finished with vocals and stuff, I'm more likely to say, yeah, let me do that. That's fun. That'll be cool. I'll, I'll find something and you'll do what you do to me. But when I get that, the way we record today is let's put a scratch guitar. It's going to be replaced. Let's put a scratch vocal. It's going to be replaced. Don't play with my guitar. That's a little bit off the groove out of the pocket, a little bit off the, and, and, you know, one of my things to play the music I play on YouTube is I follow the music pretty well. I mean, I'm not perfect, but you know how music kind of does this. I kind of go with it. You know, well, when you're locking down a track with a scratch guitar and a scratch vocal, guess what they're doing? They're, they're not completely with the click and they want you to be perfect with the click. And then you feel bad. Like I get done with the session. I go, oh, I was a little, little in front. And I know my, I know how I play too. I always push the kick a little bit. I'm always a little head on the kick. I can sit back with the backbeat, but the kick is always like pushing for some reason. And that's why I would never have been made it in Nashville. You know, that's why John Hammond replaced me on that album I was on, you know, you know, he ended up doing, you know, four tracks of this, of the 10 on that album I played on in 87 for that band uh, Saved by Grace. John Hammond has the pocket, man. He knows how to do this stuff. There are guys that love doing what they do and they do it well. And I, I got to commend them. You know what I mean? I, I say, yeah. But I don't know. It's like, you, that's not, you got to have inspiration. That's what I'm saying. Music's about inspiration, especially now at my age. I just like, I don't have time for that crap anymore. Fired <laughs> <laughs> up. No, thanks. Huh? <laughs> Pass it on. <laughs> Yeah, no, I understand. And then occasionally, you know, you were talking about like some bands being on your radar because your son had put them on there. And like Weezer was one of those bands for me. 21 Pilots was one of those bands for me that my son put on my radar. And I've really developed an affinity for their music. Right. Um, and then and then now, like I don't have any any kids that live with us. So I fortunately this YouTube community has given me an opportunity to discover music, whether it's, you know, old, older music or, or newer music and be like, Oh, cool. And, um, you know, you were talking about pop and it's like once in a blue moon, like a pop song will catch me either. It's got a really great hook or I'm like, wow, that's actually deeper than most pop lyric, you know, lyrics that are out there. But but yeah, for the most part, I gravitate toward what I what I love. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot to be said for that. So, so now I, I, we don't have to get too deep into this because I know you just you just released a video talking about it a lot. But you're sitting in front of your concert Tom kit, so you've yeah. got you have a love for concert toms. I have a love for drums and cymbals. Okay. <laughs> 
ask my wife. She'll tell you. You know what I mean? She'll tell you. I've got 15 snare drums. I got over almost 60 cymbals hanging around here. They keep creeping in, even though I say I'm not buying anything. I end up buying something stupid every other week. You know, it seems like always finding something. I'm not buying the way I used to buy. Um, but the concert toms were something I enjoyed as a kid. And I always wanted a kit, but they went out of vogue as fast as they came in almost, it seemed like, you know. It was probably a good 10 years in the 70s. You had lots of concert toms. Neil Peart had them on his kit. Peart, however you say his name. So those guys, it's Peart. You know, they'll write it out to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, he said he had concert toms on his kits right up into the 90s. So, I mean, they were still around in the 80s, but it was a lot less. You know what I mean? But there was a certain concert Tom vibe that started in the 60s. Like even Ringo in that Get Back movie, you look at it, he's got a 12 Tom with a two heads on it, a 13 with two heads, and then his floor Tom's got no bottom head on it. And you're saying, why? Now, maybe he's just lazy. Maybe the try, maybe he got the sound he wanted. That's good. We like that one. And that was, they said, don't touch it, Ringo. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, from the, 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 the Doors, John Densmore, he basically used to play this little Ludwig kit with a 12 inch Tom with no bottom head and a, and a 14 by 14 floor Tom with no bottom head, you know? So there was a certain sound you got with them. So I always dug that sound. And I think guys really dig the sound I'm getting from these drums yeah. and I've got dialed in and the music I'm playing in the seventies, it almost required that dialed in sound. So I have a harder time getting that really flat, punchy concert Tom sound out of my double headed kit. So I'm thinking, why should I do it? You know, why, why should I use that kit? Unless it's something that requires that sound, then I pull right. that kit. Now, I have three kits, so I can do what I want, you know? Yeah. So. Well, in, in the way you've got your, like those, well, both your kits, but your concert time kit, particularly, since we're talking about that, the way you've got it, it EQ'd and the way you work it into the mix, like, I mean, dude, I'm always like, Dang, that sounds so good. I'm a big fan of the way they sound and the way that you use them. I mean, they're fantastic. You know, the hardest thing for concert toms for most people is getting around a bunch of drums. You know, I grew up playing bigger kits. Like, even my Gretsch kits got six toms to it. You know what I mean? I always yeah. liked having a lot of drums to play off of. Um, I think that's the hardest thing with these things. Now, EQing them. There's not a magic to it. I have a plugin that I call my, it's my magic plugin right now. It's the Oxford drum gate. Um, if I was to pick a plugin that I really enjoy, that's the plugin I've been using on everything. It's got a very open and uh, a guy named Kirky B. He was a, he's a studio drummer in LA. He's played with uh, Sarah McLaughlin and the time he went out with the time and he's played with Mick Jagger and Elton John and stuff. Kirky was hawking this product last last year around this time, I think, on Instagram. And I saw the product. I think it was last year. I, I'm losing time. It could have been two years ago. But I saw him hawking the product, and it was like, I think it was like 30 bucks or something. It was like some deal they were given. I bought it cheap, and it works. It is the best, coolest drum gate. I used to always use the Logic gate. For, so, you know, my, my, my EQ channel was really, there's a high tom, a medium tom, and a low tom EQ in Logic. Mm -hmm. And then there's a channel like low tom, high tom, medium tom. I was use, I used that standard channel. I just made a few little tweaks to it. And if something sounds a lot of weird, I'll just kind of move the EQ a little bit, the parametric EQ, and get it to kind of where it looks right and sounds right to me. And I don't do that very often. Now I've got them kind of really dialed in, a low, high, and a, and a, and a mid. And then I replaced the, the logic gate for this, this Oxford drum gate. And all I do is I go to big tom sound, or there's only two presets. One's a big tom, and one's the T-towel, they call it. And T-towel is like muted toms, like putting towels on your toms. Okay. And each time, you want to hear what a different sounding drum sounds like. You put a towel on top of it, and it sounds like nothing, you know? That's what right. it sounds like. But the mic doesn't know that, and it goes, oh, doo -doo. And then you pull it out a little bit, put some reverb on and all of a sudden it sounds huge, you know? And that's the trick. 
So it's EQ, it's the gating, it's a little compressed, it's the same compressor, the logic compressor on the toms. I mean, I have this set up as a preset studio setup. I don't, I don't mess with that stuff. I am telling you, I literally don't spend very much time messing with stuff. I've got it dialed in where I want it. If I hear something weird, I'll have to go in. But if I don't, sounds cool. And I use those presets and I go from t towel to the big tom sound. And usually when I'm on the double-headed kit, I go to t towel. And usually when I'm on this kit, I go to the bigger toms. It sounds a little bit bigger. And the other thing is the reverbs. I have two reverbs I use on a, on a bus. So I reverb to a big plate reverb and I dial in as much as I want. And then I have a gated reverb. And I always have the gated reverb there. I don't always use it. And I dial in as much as I want to dial in. And that's what makes the toms really big and huge. You know, that with the snare, I've got a, I got a bigger snare reverb. So I've got three reverbs on the snare. It's the same main reverb plate. Then I've got the gated reverb if I want to use it. And then I've got a snare sample in the Logic sampled reverb. You know, I forget what it's called. Um, but I use that one. And that's pretty much it. And snare drum, I spend a little more time on. I have a plugin by UAD called Poltec, Poltec Pro, which is, I, I, I totally endorse, I don't endorse, I do endorse it. Endorsement means you say you, you use it. And right, so right. I use the UAD plugins. I use a bunch of UAD plugins. And my main one being the Poltec Pro on the snare drum. And I use... That on the snare and the kick, and I use the Neve um, 88R, I think it is, on the kick drum. And then I run it all through a Ampeg 102R tape emulation on the bus. And I run an Oxford expander, I think it's called, or inflator it's called. And I run precision limiter and precision bus compression so i've got like that's what's on my main bus and i actually have a video on how i do this and i show all those plugins pretty much oh excellent okay you know if you want to see it you know it's it's not a secret it's just i there is thing to your ear though you have to use your ear yeah now i get to the point with snare drums where that's probably what changes the most is the snare sound i will spend time eqing the snare a lot more than anything else but even that it's very quick dialing it in. I get it in the mix and then I go to the snare drum channel and I solo it. And then I dial that in to where I get the, the punch and the attack the way I want it. And the other thing I use is SPL's transient designer on, on the kick and the snare. And that gives a lot of punch that punches it. So it's kind of like a transient plugin. So now you got my secret. However we can do my sound tomorrow, just go out and buy all those plugins from UAD and you're, you're, in, you're in good shape. You know? <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, your knowledge, your knowledge of all that is way beyond mine. Like I am not a sound engineer, you know, like I'm kind of, I was working with a friend of mine and, um, and he's like, he's like, what are you doing to get your drum sound? Cause like, I want to, and I was like, so I'm showing him and he goes, Oh, these are just all presets. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I just find ones that I like and then I'll add compression or, you know, whatever to make it to get the sound I want for that particular tune. Right. And sometimes I have to steer my way myself away from like that really big 80s rock sound because I dig it, but it doesn't necessarily fit something that I'm, you know, that I'm playing. And that's what's so cool about your mix too, Earl, is that uh, it always fits whichever kit you're on like it, it seems to fit perfectly with the song you're playing i think that's part of the art to it yeah that is the art and it's picking the right pieces for the kit you know what i mean i have a few really good drums snare drums that work really well i'll have to be honest uh the 5 by 14 black beauty ludwig snare drum classic uh is a classic um the six and a half is what everybody talks about today. You know, for years, it was the six and a half. I have one of those now. Um, I'm not as impressed with the six and a half as I am with the five. And I, I, I was listening to an interview this year sometime, and somebody was talking about how Je it was Jeff's drum tech, actually, Jeff Picaro's drum tech, how Jeff, it was Paul Jameson, Jeff Picaro's drum tech. He built the Jameson 
Carl Rack, famous Pearl Rack that started all the rack craze in the in the eighties. I don't know if you know that, but that's where it came from. I did not know that. That's interesting. Drum rack thing was not happening until Jeff Picaro put his drums on a rack and then Pearl started selling them. And then all of a sudden Tam had a rack and Yama had a rack and everybody had a rack all of a sudden. And it was before electronic drums had racks, you know. Actually, I think Simmons might have been on a rack. Simmons went on a rack right after that rack thing came out. Yeah, everything everything goes ties to that Jeff Picaro rack, the square pearl rack, which is now called the icon rack because they don't want to pay Jeff any money for it, I guess. And, you know, his family, I don't because they took his name off of it after he died. But um anyhow, I digress. See, that's about a little bit of my drum knowledge just coming out of my brain out of nowhere. It. But uh Jeff used a five by fourteen Black Beauty a lot on a lot of sessions. That was the his go to drum, you know? And it, I know why it just has a certain sound. I have a story about why I bought that drum, why I trade. I actually didn't buy that drum. A friend of mine came down to my studio with that drum in his hand. He said, look what I got. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, that's the sounding drum of a drum I wanted to buy when I bought that stupid Pearl free floater three and a half by 14 piccolo snare drum that I got my nickname from called the hammer. I got that from buying a piccolo and hammering the, the lead singer's ears off one day, the next rehearsal. He goes, I'm going to call you the hammer. That thing's killing me. Because it was like, bash, bash, bash. It was <laughs> it was the rage. He had to have a piccolo. It had a brass pickle and it was killing. Oh, yeah, but that'll cut. Same day, I walked into this drum shop. They had a Ludwig brass superphonic. And I was like, that's a cool drum. It wasn't a Black Beauty. It was a brass superphonic from the 50s. And I was they were charging a little bit more money than the Pearl brand new. My wife said, hey, you came in to get that drum. Why don't you spend the money on that? You know, I saved 25 bucks. I wish I hadn't saved 25 bucks. Let's put it that way. So gotcha. then one day, my friend's drum walks in the room and he goes, oh, look what I got. Blah, blah, blah. My friend Ken. Oh, and it didn't sound really good. I said, can I, touch, let me, can I touch that a little bit? Like tune it up a little bit. Start hitting. I go, oh, I love this drum. I said, well, can I trade you for this drum? Because he didn't seem like he was into it that much. He goes, well, I only want Ludwig drums. I only had one Ludwig drum hanging around that he would take because he already had a Superphonic. So he goes, um, I'll take that that uh, bronze hand hammered six and a half by 14 for this. And I had to trade a six and a half by 14 bronze hand hammered Ludwig from the 90s. Monroe badge. It was the Bill Stewart drum, they call it, because Bill Stewart was the guy that made that drum famous by playing that particular snare drum on a ton of jazz stuff back in the 90s and 2000s. And today, he still uses that drum. So, and my friend Scott Hazen gave it to me. So I said, oh, gosh, I'm, you know, Scott wanted me to have this drum, but I'm trading it for the drum. My, this is like, this is the drum I've been hearing in my head my whole life, and now I found it. So nice. I traded it. So let's talk about your um your Pisty symbols or pasty. How do you say it? What's the correct? It's Pisty. Pisty. That's how I've always said it. And then I always second guess myself because I'll hear, you know, it's like Tama and Tama. So anyway, Peart and Pert. <laughs> yeah, Peart and Pert for sure. No doubt about that. So no, what made you Pisty? Pisty. Um I started using Pisces symbols a long time ago. I have a video on me talking about my Pisces journey early. One of my earliest videos I did talking. Um, but about 2015, um, I started buying Pisces a little bit more regularly. I bought a giant beat ride and then I ended up buying, I had a 505 Pisces crash and that just started my collection. And by the time I hit 2016, 17, I was seriously buying Piesty symbols. And I ended up getting my 505 hi-hats back from my friend. And I got my, I got a set of giant beats and I've been slowly just playing Piesty as my main symbols, but I have a whole set of Zildjian's, a whole, like a whole set of Zildjian's, a whole set of Sabian's. I played Sabian for like 20 years, pretty much. Cause just cause I bought them. I bought them and that's all I could afford. I had I had one set of symbols for years. I only had one set of symbols with a Piesty China and a Piesty China and a set of rude hi-hats that I bought in the 80s. Um, those were kind of the exceptions. 
and everything else was Sabian. I had Sabian 20, uh, 19 inch ride, a medium heavy ride and a crash ride, 18 inch sound control and a 17 inch thin crash and a couple AAX small crashes. And that was my Sabian setup for years. And then I guess it was 2012. I went to Maxwell's drum shop in New York and bought the Piesty 505. And I'd already bought a couple other Pisces that I'd been, um, been using like the dark energy that gets that got in the video with Steve, the Steve Gad video I just did. That dark energy ride, I was I was in Forks Drum Shop in Nashville in 2006, and I bought that there. It was a prototype. It was pretty reasonably priced, like 230 bucks, 37 bucks. And I bought that because it sounded like the Steve Gad ride to me. I was like, oh, that's the sound. And I didn't care about blending, but now I'm kind of I've got kind of like peisty snobbish lately. I, stay with Pice. I don't blend very often. Like I don't pull a Zildjian. Matter of fact, I don't even think Zildjian's record as well as Pisces. That's what, that's my thing now. You yeah, know, gotcha. I get an easier sound with Pisces and then I have to work so much harder with the B20 Zildjian's for some reason. So. Interesting. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's cool. I just always think it's interesting. Like, um, what, cause I think those are like the three biggest players on the market, Sabian, Zildjian, and Peisty. And now Minel's much bigger than you think. They're oh. huge. Yeah, seeing more and more of them. And they've got and I've listened to some samples of their stuff like on Sweetwater's website. And um and a lot like I mean their high end stuff sounds really, really good. It just depends on what you're looking for, I guess. I agree. It's the high end stuff that is really good. The by Bi- Zance stuff I like a lot. Um from what I heard, I don't have any of it. I've never bought any. Yes. You know, when I got the I got into that whole B8 side of symbols versus the B20 side, which is what Zildjian and Sabian are known for. They all make B8 symbols, but they don't make them well. I mean, you don't want a B8 Pro Sabian. I mean, I mean, if you're just starting out, they're fine symbols. And I guess I don't want to offend any any drummers that might watch your channel because I know you're way more hooked up in the drum community than than I am, <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of guys that are just starting out, you know, you start out on what you got, you make do with what you have. I get it. You have to do that. You know, um, it's just kind of funny when the, the, the old gear that when I was a kid, you just didn't want to have you cringe if you had a made in Japan kit, you know, or they, they call them stencil kits. Um, today are like so coveted you know they're selling them for like a thousand dollars get some old u.s mercury pro or a, a drum kit and i'm like you know it's got luon mahogany shells which are very cool sounding you know you put the right heads on them but they didn't cost 130 150 bucks when i was a kid and now they're selling that kit for like a thousand dollars on on ebay and i'm going why because you know um Aaron Sterling has one of these kits, you know, so that's why they're, they're, they're you know, they didn't yeah. get any, but they're just still crappy. It's just, you, how do you make a crappy drum sound good? You put some decent heads on it. That's what I've learned. How do you make a B8 sound okay? It's how you hit it. It's how you play it. It's your approach to it. But if I am playing thick B8 Sabians, I don't enjoy it. So I bring my own cymbals to gigs. You know, I've learned you bring cymbals and snare drums and pedals. Yeah. Play else's kit. I could take a, the worst sound in Tom kit and just kind of dial it in. But cymbals are harder to do that with. But if you just start get B8s, they're fine. I think the SR Sabians are better. You know, the, the ones they are, are seconds, they melted and they redid or they recut them or something. Okay. They sound B8 pros. But Peisty does B8. That's what they do. This is what they're all about. Their B8 is their thing. So they do it well. You know? Gotcha. Gotcha. I didn't even, I didn't know that that was, I just learned a lot about symbols that I did not know. For me, it was just, I like the way these sound. <laughs> yeah. And I, again, that goes back to, you know, my, my obsession with gear and that's where I started and YouTube. The reason I started a YouTube channel, I think was because I started talking on camera. I did a Piesty video. I did a video about my favorite drummer, Danny Serafin as a kid. I did a drum uh, video about John Hammond, which was kind of nice. I sent it to him and he watched and he commented and we, we've gone back and forth a few times, talked about things outside of this. 
And I saw him at an Amy Grant concert right before COVID. He was he was subbing for Greg Morrow, who I know Greg Morrow too. And um, that was cool, you know. Uh, that I've stayed in touch with the guy who replaced me on the on the album I played on. That's kind of, you know. That is cool. You know, you said Greg Morrow, so I just want to nerd out with you for two seconds. I know, I know him from his work with DeGarmo and Key. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. DeGarmo and Key and Amy Grant. He played with Amy Grant back on the, her first live album back in 1980. Nice. I think he toured with her on maybe maybe it was the Lead Me On tour. It was yeah. My wife interviewed him for Modern Drummer for that tour. Nice. And she interviewed Amy that tour. So we saw that tour twice, once at the Garden State Arts Center and once at the Nassau Coliseum. And at the Garden State Arts Center, we went backstage and I met Greg and Terry McMillan, the percussionist at the time. That's probably my fam favorite Amy Grant album is Leave Me On, I think. Oh, fan freaking tastic album. It's one of my favorites, too. It was her most soulful production, I think. And it was it was probably her sweet spot where she wasn't being overproduced and she was doing what she wanted to do, you know. So, but yeah. that was cool. That was a good period for CCM, by the way. Like the late eighties, there was some. Russ Tap had a great album too, the the, the gray Russ Tap album. Yeah, a long coat on, and he's standing there. That's got some. I still believe, and he didn't write that song, but that's a great song, and a couple other ones. And by the yeah. way, the played on most of that stuff was Paul Lyon. He was the drummer that played on a lot of that, that music, you know? Nice. And right now, Matthew Jackson, if he's watching this interview, is like nerding out with us <laughs> about these names we're throwing out. <laughs> yeah, Matthew Jackson is, is a CCM authority, so I'll give him that. Got to give him credit for that one. Absolutely. As, well, that is super cool. And, um, and, and yeah, like we could do a whole video just talking about like Amy Grant's Lead Me On album. Um, I feel probably, like probably <laughs> could. a few of those covers too. I need to, I need to pull, pull one and do, do one from that album just because it's, it's, it is, it's such an honest album. Yeah. Uh, um, in so many ways. I love it. Yeah. And I mean, and they were going through some struggles then. They're, 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 the struggles began. There was a lot of things to struggle, but I'm not going to talk about them on camera. So, <laughs> right, yeah. There's a lot of stuff that's it, kind of Amy's story. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, no. I, one of the things that I think that's that's cool, and um, in addition to your drum stuff that you do on your channel that I really enjoy, are the the few the few sit downs with your wife that you've done, um, talking about music relationship you know life and and uh, what what made you want to start doing that on your channel because i think it's fantastic you know i have to give steph a lot of the credit for me doing this you know i i, I talked to a couple ask girl any things ago i think it was the last one possibly about terry keating you know bonzolium he is like one of the he's like a legend of youtube he got written up in Modern Drummer magazine about, you know, they did YouTube drummers a year ago when I was still subscribing to Modern Drummer. I actually have the issue. He was on there, plus the Dandy Bushell, you know, the yeah. Dave Roll's fav favorite drummer, you know, and a couple other YouTube type people. And they talked to him. Terry Keating was on the YouTube in my studio. I'm watching him nerding out about Peisty symbols. And my wife walks in and she goes, you could do that, Earl. You you could you could just talk to a camera and talk about all that. That's what you talk about. You know all that stuff. Like when she was doing modern drummer articles, I was helping her prep the questions. Not all of them, you know. But she would come to me like, "What do you think of this?" And should I ask this equipment question? And she would ask the questions I wanted her to ask. That was pretty cool. That's Sometimes when she was doing these interviews, I was getting the kind of interviews I wanted, you know. <laughs> which was the old style of modern drummer interviews, not the new style the way it is today. But um, I don't even know what it is today, but that's another story. But uh, yeah, so that was the starting point. And she wanted to, she got in on my first uh, Peisty Symbol video. She, she did a voiceover and she always wanted to be a part. You know what I mean? And she interviewed me early on. There's an interview of me and her talking about my career 
real early on. It's buried in in drum talk somewhere. It's in that video. I don't think anybody watches it, but I talk about my school experience and all kinds of stuff. And I've got thousands. I got a couple thousand. I got a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred videos, probably. So nobody goes through my catalog and knows all the stuff I've done and as seen. You know what I mean? So this year we were talking. At our co- we we have this time we call co- coffee time. We get together and we talk every day. And we were talking, and she said, "You know, I I'd like to do this show. We should do a show called Conversations." And she came up with the name. But I was interviewing my friend Scott, and then I interviewed Matthew Jackson, and they were conversations. So I just put it under the conversations heading. But I think it's going to all become stuff in my show. That's what's going to be coming. The last two I've done has been one for her book. And that was where it started. It was like, you know, could you interview interview me for my book kind of thing? And we can talk about my book. And I thought, well, let's give it a try and see what my subscribers think of it, you know. But before we did that, we did the one about relationships. I thought that would hit more. And she's always been around. Like Mrs. Hammer's been referenced for the last five years at different points in time. So guys kind of know her a little bit, you know, I, I talk, talk about her that way. So she's been on my channel before that, but I think it's going to become a more of a regular thing. It's going to be something we're going to do more regularly. That's the goal. Probably 2023. If we can get our stuff together, you know, I'd like to do at least once a quarter, maybe once every two months, maybe once a month if we really could get it together. But it's, it's figuring out what to talk about too. The right. Right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I totally get that. But the the ones you've done have just been fantastic. And it's, and I think it's neat. It's really neat to see, um, you know, you've talked about referencing Mrs. Hammer, which I love that. So great. Um, But then to put a face with the name and a voice, like, and and, um, to see Earl's, you know, better half. (laughs) Uh, Like, I think any, any man that's honest, um, if he's married to a great woman, we'll be like, no, she's definitely the better, the better half of this organization. Uh, no, she's she's my better half. Forty, almost forty years. It'll be forty years in March. So awesome! That's fantastic. I love it. That's awesome. Well, <clears throat> what advice would you give to anybody that's starting out to play the drums, Earl? What would you tell them? Well, starting out, do it because you love it. That's all I would say. Play music because you love playing music. Don't, if you're doing it to just find your, you know, to be an influencer or something, you know, there's there's going to be better drummers than you. <laughs> That's not a good enough reason. You know what I mean? But if you love it, the beat's in you and you want to do it, play it and enjoy it and love it, you know? And it'll give back to you what you put into it. That's the other thing. Mm, That's good. It takes a lot of work. Yeah, I remember a long time ago I was teaching teaching somebody some lessons and, and they were they were about my age. Like back, I mean, this was years and years ago, but like um we got done with a lesson and we were just going over some basics, you know, how to hold your stick, you know, quarter notes, whole notes, you know, these little basic things, root so a basic rudiments, you know, a paradil or whatever. And we get to the end of this lesson and I go, I go, do you have any questions? He goes, When can I play in a rock band? <laughs> and I was like, this, it was it, even then 20 plus years ago, maybe 30 years ago, it was like, so in, um, that's kind of how I think everybody approaches stuff in our culture today is we want to be the rock star, but we don't want to, to grind it out to get to that place, whatever it is, you know, whatever being a rock star looks like, <clears throat> we want to, we want to have the final goal. We want to have the destination, but we don't want to put in the hard work during the journey i mean i will tell you that this journey is not ending i've been doing this 47 years playing i've actually been playing drums longer than that i started in sixth grade so i'm probably 50 something years but playing a drum kit about 47 almost 48 years now so i've had a drum kit um and i will tell you that i i think i'm getting better my my playing's getting better the more mature I get because I hear things differently than I did when I was in my twenties. And why I also know that I wouldn't have made it as a studio drummer. I might've been a touring drummer. If I really wanted to be a touring drummer, I probably would have became a touring drummer, but I did not have the, and to this day, I don't think I have the level of creativity it takes 
to be that studio drummer, that perfect time, plus that hearing something creatively. I wasn't, I didn't dig in enough. And probably it's part of the path I chose. You know, I chose love, I chose family, but I didn't give up the music. My wife made it clear to me very early on in our marriage. She said, you would not be you if you're not doing what you love. And she wanted to do what she loved too. And she eventually got in the show and did a wedding. We did a wedding band together and she was the singer. And we, we had a lot of fun doing that together. I wish that, that could have continued. As a matter of fact, if I could find a keyboard player and a bass player and do a great American songbook gigs in town with her singing, you know, some tunes and us playing light jazz and Sinatra and me playing brushes and us four piece kit, you know, with my Zildjian cymbals, because they would be the right cymbals for that gig. I'd sit there and I'd, I'd love to do that gig if we're doing it together, but I don't want to really do gigs right now in town. Me going out to go play in a bar to get accolades. I get more accolades on YouTube, believe it or not. So YouTube is like I, I, all the pats on the back I, I can need. I have a great subscriber base of people that love what I do and they let me know it. And that's why I'm crazy enough to put out almost a video every day. I don't think I miss a day once in a while that I don't put out a video. So yeah. Now that's now there, here's an interesting conversation because you and I have taught, uh, talked about this before. We we approach how we come at covers differently in terms of like I'll plan out so I have a game plan, but you like to like what am I what what am I digging on today? And that's yeah. how, that's how you record, and that works for you. And um, it works for me because I again I'll do seven songs in a weekend. Some weekends I'll just sit here and blow out tunes. I'll like. Steph does her thing on during the day on Saturday and I do my thing and then same thing on Sunday. And if I'm playing at church or not playing at church, that'll depend on what I do. A lot of times Friday afternoon, about three o'clock, I close up shop pretty much, you know, keep my eye on if some stray email shows up and I sit down, I blow out two drum covers on Friday evening, you know, boom, nice. you know, it's not hard to do when I don't have to spend a lot of time learning the songs that they're kind of in me and I just, they kind of come out, you know, and I've got my process. And so I do it very, rather quick, but I'm not anal. I mean, there are guys that are anal about cutting film. I get it. You can be really anal if you want to, you go, Oh, let's do this. And let's do the Ken Burns effect. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? If you were to watch me cut a video, I, I before my hair appointment, my wife, had hers her appointment and my appointment were today at the same time that was that was the variable for today if she wasn't feeling good i was gonna have to drive her and then we were gonna drive home together i didn't realize i could have got away with that but she actually got out of the chair and left before i left okay that was kind of funny i thought <laughs> i go first at seven and you could have went you know but anyhow long and the short of that i had like a half i had 20 minutes between the time I had to leave, because she left first about 6.30 this morning. My appointment was at 7.30. I had a 15-minute ride. And I sat down in my studio, and I cut yesterday's drum cover that I was goofing with. Because I didn't have time to finish it. So I just threw it in the final cut, and I started listening to the two takes I liked. And I started cutting. I cut it in 20 minutes. They're done. All I got to do is put my little name on it, you know, the front end. And make sure that the pixelation problem is not happening. Because I got this new pixelation problem, which is something we can talk about offline. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the heck is going on, but, you know. Yes. Cameras are finicky. Final Cut's finicky. Probably my hard drive needs to be replaced. It's been, how many times can you erase and redo and erase and redo before you have to reformat? That's good. That's really the, I think I'm figuring that out. You've hit the <laughs> threshold. <laughs> Or 18 is when I bought that computer. It's oh. only five. The computer's fine, but it's got a finite hard drive. So maybe I need to move. Maybe I need to move to like, you know, um, Thunderbolt, you know, um, separated, you know, server drives or something, you know, but I, I just haven't wanted to spend that kind of money. You know what I mean? <laughs> now I, I run like everything is just off. Like I have several different, like one terabyte drives. Or whatever, because I don't want to buy bigger drives because they're more expensive. But I, so I like run everything through those. Like nothing is saving to my computer. So the processing speed can always be doing what it's doing when I'm editing, but it's all saving to an external, an external drive. 
Does that work for video? Yeah. Uh-huh. Because I find with audio, recording audio, you can't record to an external drive through a USB or does and are you on Thunderbolt? Um do, 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 do. no, it's just USB um three, three point oh. Well it's USB three is Thunderbolt. That's what it is. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> you Thunderbolt sounds way cooler. <laughs> well that's that's Apple's term for USB three, it's Thunderbolt. They were using it first, and then now apparently Windows has adopted it because I just got a new computer with Thunderbolt. And that apparently the iPhone I bought, iPhone 12, came with a cable that went into a Thunderbolt adapter. I was like, how useless is this? I don't even have a Thunderbolt adapter. All I have is a USB adapter. So I had to go on Amazon and buy an adapter for Thunderbolt, you know what I mean? Or USB 3, whatever they call it. Right. So <laughs> USB 3 is way faster than USB 2. Yeah, I don't have a USB three drive. That's what I you you're telling me that works, mm. and I only have one USB three port in my computer, and right now my interface comes in through that. So are you running through one USB three port, or you got a couple on your computer? Well, so my inner my interface is going through the um the USB C, I think is what it's called now, like the new port. And then the drive is just going to the U, the 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 US the three point or whatever the Thunderbolt yeah. Interesting. We should talk about this offline. It's a waste. This is a wasted conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it'll help somebody. Maybe it'll help somebody. <laughs> Edward gets way too nerdy for me. Even I like I, I'd be out of here by right about now. You know, so. Well, let me ask you one more question about your setup here, because <clears throat> I know there was some um, in the time that I've been following you. There's been some visual changes, so um, you've added a green screen to the to the mix. Uh, yeah, occasionally. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, it's not there all the time, but like, and I'm actually I'm, it's in the forefront of my mind because I see it behind you. Um, <laughs> what what made you want to start uh, playing with green screen stuff for your videos? Um. Chadwick Perry, Double Deuce Drums. Amazing guy. Chadwick is. And the interesting thing is he's been really kicking his butt to try to get subs and working his way up to a thousand subscribers. He is a, a pro player. And here's here's my thing about YouTube. Okay, just and this is some of you guys may not like what I'm gonna say. Probably those guys don't watch me anyhow, so it's nothing new under the sun. But um I really enjoy mm -hmm. pro and find them. And I found Chadwick in right around COVID time. And I started, and if I like, if I like your video and I like what you're doing, I'll write you and I'll say, Hey, you're doing great. You know? So we struck it up. And then in 21, when I was doing hanging with the hammer, my live stream show, you came on and he came on, he came on one of my early shows and we kind of struck it. And we're kind of like quasi friends, you know, like YouTube friends, you know, I consider us friends. And he was doing green screen. I said, how do you do that? And he goes, just put a green screen up and you just pro video. And I said, well, getting the video is the hardest part. How do you capture the video? He goes, well, I just use screen caption on my iPad. And I just take the video. I was like, really? That's that easy? So whenever I get like a video, a, a song where I can find a video for it and I feel like going the extra mile, which is it's one extra step, put it in under, you know, and then it shows up on the green screen, I will do it. And it, it's fun. It adds a little something else once in a while. He does it for everything. And he's got, he tapes green poster board all over his, his studio to get green screen everywhere. And he's really, he's really good at it. He's the best. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm just a, I'm just a guy copying right now. You know what I mean? But I will say he made a, he made a concert time kit so he could have one because he saw all my concert time videos. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he, I was part of the inspiration for that. Not that he might he might have wanted one too. Who knows? I think, but, you know. That's awesome. I think it's neat too. Like I've I've seen that in our in the the drumming community here on YouTube too. It's like um, you'll see you'll see or hear something you like, and everybody's willing to like, hey, this is how I'm making that happen. If you reach out and ask, um, I know I mentioned that with a couple other guys in our videos. And I love and I love that. Oh, you'd be like, man, I really like what's happening with that. You know, what camera are you using? And then 
and you kind of uh, you kind of adopt and then adapt stuff for for your purposes and what's working for your channel put your own spin on it i think that's kind of what you've done or like you know chad with his uh his concert time i think he's got like a different drum set for every song <laughs> by the way <laughs> does and you know that's one of the questions i just got asked for the next task or anything so i'm not going to answer this completely but i try to pick the kit for the song so i will move stuff around i'm not stuck on this configuration of this concert tom kit you know sometimes i'll have the high toms sometimes i'll move the toms around and if you watch my videos you'll notice my kits always look a little different they're like well well it's similar but maybe the some of the symbols are in the same places. I like certain symbols for certain things, but I'm always changing snares and I move toms around. And I, visually, I think that makes it more appealing, you know? Yeah. And when I'm watching drum covers, why am I watching a drum cover? I'm watching a drum cover to see a dr what a drummer does with it. And the, the fact that he, he was always changing his kits around kind of caught my eye. And that's why I started watching them. Yeah. You know, um, I will tell you, I have the hardest time with some of the e kits, you know, it's like they sound different, but they look the same all the time to me. So unless you're playing some phenomenal stuff on it, I you lose me after a few. You know, I may watch a minute, you know, but I, I got to be honest, I don't have the time to watch videos like I used to. I early on, I used to watch a lot. And I know that's probably why I haven't made any traction in the drum community. <laughs> I don't even have time to go on Facebook anymore. So. It's it's tough. I think that's one of the biggest, like, I, I don't want to make this sound like a complaint because I'm really thankful, you know, yeah. like I've said this before that anybody even gives a crap about what we're, what we're doing is amazing to me. You know, like even whether they watch for a minute or eight minutes, it's just amazing to me. Um, but it is, it is difficult. I think that's one of the most difficult things about trying to maintain a channel is trying to keep up with, with other people's content, you know, while creating new content for your channel. It's a, it's yeah. a difficult thing to do. It takes some discipline. And when you're starting out, I think that that's part of what you're doing to get your following. I, I will, I will tell you how I started. I started out, I was doing this by accident. I give drum man 190 credit for getting me into that crazy drum cover of the year in 2017 contest that I won. I won it. Nice. Carry on my wayward son. You know, um, somebody wants to do a, a cover of that with me. And I said, all right, well, I've ever done that song. I sent it to him. He goes, well, that's 2017. Well, if I'm going to record it again, <laughs> then let's do the short version because I don't want to do the long version again. You know? <laughs> Let's do the three minute version so I can knock that out, five, you know, in five or 10 takes and be finished with it, you know, and knock it out. But um, I just, I, I had a goal. Like as soon as I got into doing drum covers, I had 400 subscribers in January of 2018. YouTube changed the game. It used to be 10,000 views and you were monetized. I was, I was monetized already. And they took it away and they said, nope, you got to have a thousand subscribers and 4,000 hours of view time. And it's like, how are you going to do this? And I stumbled on my Ask Girl Anything show. And then I started doing them every week because I would get quite, I was doing videos every day. I said, well, I, I was, even back then I was turning out four or five videos a weekend in my, with my crazy you know, DSLR and my crazy zoom camera that was really terrible, you know, and didn't figure out I could use my iPhone at that point quite yet, you know, or my iPad really. And long and the short of it, I just plowed through and by June of 2018, I had a thousand subscribers and I had over the 4,000 hours of view time because I started that crazy ask girl anything show and people would watch me talk about drums every week. Every week I had questions and every week I was on. And I did that the first year. The first year, pretty much I was weekly. The second year, I was like, oh, I don't know if I can keep this up. <laughs> so it's gotten to once a month now because I just can't. That takes more out of me to edit is to ask girl anything. than any of these talking shows are more editing than playing a drum cover. So gotcha. but that's, my channel grew from that. 
And once I hit a thousand subscribers, every 10 months I hit a thousand more subscribers. I don't do anything. The video content is churned. It's so apparently it's in the loop. And when I go back and I look at my, you know, YouTube studio, I see, oh, I got 10,000 views on that, that video. How did that video get 10,000 views? <laughs> my way by, by Frank Sinatra. You know, it's like, why do I got 10,000 views of that? It's probably because that crazy Chinese guy you know or japanese guy getting up at the at the wedding and playing <laughs> so terribly somebody put in like my way drum cover and there's earl playing it the right way you know? okay this guy's really good <laughs> you know i've got i got a bunch of videos like that that have kind of got in got in those those places but this year i've actually seen some videos come to get up to a thousand faster than i ever have and usually my covers get somewhere between two and 300 videos uh, views now, apparently. So most covers. So it used to be like somewhere around 120 to 100 to 200 views. So now I've kind of stepped up a little bit because I'm at 6,000 something subscribers. But truthfully, I don't really look at that. Eric, believe it or not, I don't look at the numbers. Chadwick talks a lot about how, how you... You, you basically can, you know, your mid content, getting views and getting in the stream. And I'm like, I have no formula. I just play when I want to play. Yeah. <laughs> That's my formula. So you've it. got a formula, you know, you come out with a premiere. Like I do premieres once in a while. It's like, it never worked for me. So why should I do a premiere? Let's just drop it. People find it, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And then the premieres have varied degrees of success based on time. For people, you know, for people like we've had as as few as just Loretta watching from her phone, you know, and as many as ten people show up in one night, which is a big is a big number for you know, I, like for yeah. anybody to stop what they're doing and watch the premiere at a certain time, especially if they're in the UK and it's like two in the morning, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> well, but we're not we're not a TV generation anymore. We all stream everything. Yeah, we're using the, the the cable television generation. I'm a cable television generation person. I just switched to AT and T broadband, fiber to the fiber to the house. You know, I got one gig fiber. You know, and I've got all streaming. And I got I, they they said, do you want direct TV? No, I don't want. Don't, don't put a dish on my house. I don't <laughs> want that. And I'm, I'm just gonna buy a couple streaming channels. You know, so they're taking that that money that used to be done through cable television. And it's just being divvied out differently. Amazon gets some of it, you know, the channel might get some of it, you know, and it's like, we're still paying the same amount of money, it seems like, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. But it's, it's how we get it. So a premiere is an old television kind of thing. Like, well, got to be there for the premiere. Hey, I'll catch it on the rebound. I, I, I get the replay all the time. The just sits there waiting for somebody to show up and hit on Earl, Earl drum, you know, and, Boom. Oh, there's Earl's video of the day. I got people that wait for my video to drop every day. That's the funny thing. Sometimes it drops at four in the morning when I'm dropping stuff, you know, and sometimes it's drops at seven in the morning because I've just finished coffee with my wife and I decide, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to put this in now or noontime. And it doesn't, it has no, there's no rhyme or reason to it, what I do. So nobody knows when they're going to get it from me, if they're going to get it. May not, I may keep him guessing <laughs> by accident. It's just me being lazy and not setting things up. My wife sets her YouTubes in advance. She does her show and then she basically schedules them out and she's good at it. She's, but she doesn't premiere anything. She just schedules it. Mm. I don't do any of that stuff. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> that's, that's, no. that's what I do with like these interviews is I just, I set them to go up at a certain time and they, and they drop. I don't, do premieres for those but right but the other side of that coin is there's something to be said for being organized and having a thought process and you know i think what you're trying to do is good and you know i think the biggest thing for you being in the communities and stuff is starting your drum company is you know you're getting promotion into the community and you can sell your drums, you know, that's, that's cool. And I'm seeing that grow and I'm uh, congratulate you on your success. Oh, thanks man. That, that, that's cool. That's really, that's really fun. You know, you're adding something to the community. I, I love the community of guys. Don't get me wrong. 
but I just don't have the time in the space. And when I started, there was a certain group of guys that um, were doing it ahead of me. And I kind of got in with those guys and they're all, they've all kind of waned and are not around anymore. Mm. Every once in a while they'll drop in and say hi, you know, but um, it's changed a lot. There's been a lot of change and um, I'm glad we connected. There's a few people I connect with. And I think, I think for me, really my YouTube experience with community is the guys who enjoy my stuff and want to connect with me i'll connect with you but i don't have time to play the the old youtube game of like you watch my video i watch your video thing that just i'm sorry guys i can't if, you, if i do watch your video i leave a little note say hey i said hi yeah no i watch some of your video you know I'm not guaranteed i watched the whole thing i watch some of your video you know and if that offends you, sorry, you know, don't, yeah. I'm not offended that you don't watch every one of my videos every day of the week. You know what I mean? <laughs> Nobody right. can keep videos except these 125 people that love to watch my videos, you know? Yeah. Well, you, can, you, you catch what you can and you, you consume what you can and, and engage where you can. And that's, that's all that, uh, that's all kind of, I, I expect and the expectations I put on myself you know as well i'm grateful for who show up i'm grateful for whoever watches my videos mm -hmm. i'm grateful that people get something out of them i'm grateful that people feel close enough to me to connect with me in a special way i've had a couple subscribers that have connected in very special ways and i'm an important part of their starting their drumming career up again at an older age well, i get a lot of older guys of course because they connect to the music again you know right. but YouTube for me is just having fun. That's all it is. So Earl, before, before we close out, is there anything that you would just like to leave with anybody that's watching um, us? Any drum advice, any life advice, any, anything? Um, yeah. First off, I just, the whole thing I was saying before about being grateful and, you know, appreciative of the people that watch my channel. That's how I feel. Um, you know, for me, playing music is what I enjoy doing. If somebody sees this video and enjoys what I do and they want me to record for them or want to take a lesson from me or want to get to know me in some other way and have a question that they don't want answered on Ask or anything but want to connect with me, I'm available to connect with. You can connect through you know, my Google email or earldrummanaol.com. You know, I, I'm... I'm accessible. I'm here to encourage drummers. That's what I did this channel for. This channel is about encouraging drummers and making sure drummers feel encouraged. And I, I give them my time freely as best I can. My faith is part of what I do. Everybody knows that. And hopefully I'm seen as a nice guy. That's, that's, that's really what I hope for. You know what I mean? That's what I try to be. So, Well, I think you succeed because for what it's worth, I think you're a great guy, <laughs> and uh, and That's very awesome. and very very encouraging too to 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 us here in uh, what what we're doing and uh and very helpful. That's that's very much appreciated. And and so you guys, Earl really is is a wealth of information too, like um and and encouragement. So connect connect with him if you haven't subscribed to his channel already. Go do that immediately um you'll love what he's putting out there and you'll learn something um too well it's it's fun to watch but you'll you'll learn something from watching watching and play so earl i want to thank you again for uh taking time out of your saturday morning to hang out with me thanks for having me Eric. I, I had a lot of fun it's a lot of fun thank you my my pleasure you guys thanks for stopping by we will see you next time